I've got two cool environmental stories that go together here. First, from environmentalprogress.org. On behalf of environmentalists, I apologize for the climate scare. On behalf of environmentalists everywhere, I would like to apologize, normally apologize, for the climate scare we created over the last 30 years. Climate change is happening. It's just not the end of the world. It's not even our most serious environmental problem. I'm already like, whoa, okay, let's see where this is going. I may seem like a strange person to be saying all of this. I've been a climate activist for 20 years, an environmentalist for 30, but as, energy, as an energy expert asked by Congress to provide objective expert testimony and invited by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to serve as expert reviewer of its next assessment report, I feel an obligation to apologize for how badly we environmentalists have misled the public. Great credentials here. Here are some facts few people know. We got to get this list on screen. Humans are not causing a sixth mass extinction. The Amazon is not the lungs of the world. Climate change is not making natural disasters worse. Fires have declined 25% around the world since 2003. The amount of land we use for meat, humankind's biggest use of land, has declined by an area nearly as large as Alaska. The buildup of wood fuel and more houses near forests, not climate change, explain why there are more and more dangerous fires in Australia and California. If you remember, we covered on the show the brush fires in Australia earlier this year and the general charity hoax that was around it. And it was easy to point out, looking at the history of these brush fires, that this was not even a big one or a bad one by recent historical standards. And you, you saw all these celebrities jumping on the bandwagon, just like with climate change, just like with all this other stuff, where the scarier the threat, uh, the more noble you are for coming out in the cause in protecting the environment. So back to the list. I mean, I could say more about, about all of this stuff. You know, fires decline 25. The, the, okay, the, the, the amount of land we use for meat, you know, that is huge. Maybe just because we're becoming more efficient primarily. It's not that less meat is being eaten, which, which in some cases it is, but it, which would be better if it was more of that for efficiency and, and ethics and a lot of other reasons. But even without that, just the efficiency in production. So anyway, back to the list. Carbon emissions are declining in most rich nations and have been declining in Britain, Germany, and France since the mid-1970s. Netherlands became rich, not poor, while adapting to life below sea level. We produce 25% more food than we need, and food surpluses will continue to rise as the world gets hotter. So... I mean, about this, like, why do we have starvation? Why do we have, like, homelessness in the United States? You're just an example of natural resources, not meet, or in this case, constructed resources, not meeting up with human needs, right? We have more homeless people than empty homes in America. Why? Because the Federal Reserve System, because Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, government lending, government-sponsored banking, everything else, all the corruption and zoning, building goes, and financing that grows up around the housing industry. Same thing with food. We are, as a species, capable of feeding everybody on Earth. We are already producing 25% more food than we need. Why do people go hungry? Artificially created shortages made by government. Habitat loss and the direct killing of wild animals are bigger threats to species than climate change. Wood fuel is far worse for people and wildlife than fossil fuels. Preventing future pandemics requires more, not less, industrial agriculture. I know that the above facts will found, sound like climate denialism to many people, but that just shows the power of climate alarmism. In reality, the above facts come from the best available scientific studies, including those conducted or accepted by the IPCC. 
the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, and other leading scientific bodies. Some people will, when they read this, imagine that I'm some right-wing anti-environmentalist. I'm not. At 17, I lived in Nicaragua to show solidarity with the Sandinista, Sandinista Socialist Revolution. At 23, I raised money for Guatemalan women's cooperatives. In my early 20s, I lived in the semi-Amazon doing research with small farmers fighting land invasion. At 26, I helped expose poor conditions at Nike factories in Asia. I became an environmentalist at 16 when I threw a fundraiser for Rainforest Action Network. At 27, I helped save the last unprotected ancient redwoods in California. In my 30s, I advocated renewables and successfully helped persuade the Obama administration to invest $90 billion into them. Over the last few years, I helped save enough nuclear plants from being replaced by fossil fuels to prevent a sharp increase in emissions. This is, by the way, uh, you know, a, a really great, you know, laying out of the credentials. And, you know, this is, uh, you know, from Michael Schellenberger. You can look him up and, and see this. He says uh, that he's writing a book to really capture this and make sure that uh, the, the, the full case is made. As he says, until last year, I mostly avoided speaking out against the climate scare. Partly that's because I was embarrassed. After all, I am as guilty as alarmism as any other environmentalist. For years, I referred to climate change as an existential threat to human civilization and called it a crisis. But mostly I was scared. I was afraid of losing friends and funding. Um, anyway, going ahead, though, so he, he has a list of things that he's going to be covering in the book. Factories and modern farming are the keys to human liberation and environmental progress. The most important thing for saving the environment is producing more food, particularly meat, on less land. Now, again, as, as a consumer choice vegan, I, I disagree with the premise here that we need to eat meat, but I, he is correct in terms of uh, from my understanding, in terms of as long as we maintain our current diet, then yes, if we produce more feed, especially uh, more food, especially meat on less land, we get more efficient with these processes. I mean, the way that again, this is government screwing us up, right? With subsidization of certain elements of the food producing, uh, food production industry, uh, cattle grazing land, the way that those uh, natural resources are are managed, the way that subsidies go by species, like for the cattle industry, for you know, uh, specific types of meat for chicken, for pigs, as opposed to finding all the other ways that, that producing meat through rabbits, which produce the most amount of uh, meat per calorie ingested as any feed animal. Like this is, uh, or the, you know, just all of it. And that's just one example. Maybe more things with eggs to get animal protein more efficiently, more effectively to put nutrients back in our eggs and getting out of the factory farming where, you know, you have these, like, like with so much else in food production, uh, crops and, 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 and meat that looks good, but has been uh, leached of a significant portion of its nutrients, right? So making that more efficient, getting government out of food production is going to be huge. The most important thing for reducing air pollution and carbon emissions is moving from wood to coal to petroleum to natural gas to uranium. I, I agree in principle. Um, you know, here we burn wood because it's here, it's naturally available. I think there, there are some caveats to this with localization and, and building on site and homesteading where uh, using local sources and materials for energy is, is more important. Um, and, 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 and there's one thing that I think he missed here, uh, wind and geothermal and solar. Um, I mean, you, you want to get, you know, uh, away from that. Uh, he, he points out here hundred percent renewables as, as I, cause I think this is where things go. And I think there's going to be a leap in technology coming where we're going to be able to, you know, with um, one of the things that we're lacking really is, is the engineering and incentive and distribution for technology that we already have, right? There's a better way that we can do wind turbines that are safer, that are more sustainable. We can do them locally uh, with solar connected to houses, just solar technology improving, being able to have that energy. Um, I think with wind and turbines, there's there are ways to, to get water locally out of the air that just haven't been put, I mean, you see a lot of these technologies just out there, not quite developed because they're competing with major government subsidized industries 
where the, the natural economic incentive to shift to more efficient high tech, you know, renewables in electricity and energy in general just isn't there. With geothermal, it's all you need is the machine, right? We don't have and, and to be able to to bore, to be able to and, and here like for us for it's the, the like with current well drilling technology, it doesn't make sense for us to drill a well and have our own source of water on 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 this land in Gardenia, which is really unfortunate that we have to do so much rock. It would be about forty thousand dollars to build a well here, which would be great. You know, if we had that kind of abundance, we we might get a well and and in the long run, you know, pay for itself with water. But um, for rain collection, we should be able to meet our needs if we if we set have everything on the property set up and we do it carefully. You know, we should be able to to meet all of our water and plants and and, and growing needs with with rain collection. You know, keeping my fingers crossed on on what we're able to do with that. But geothermal, you got to be able to drill a really deep hole. And have a device in there that moves water and steam through it in a way that generates energy just by taking advantage of the temperature uh, difference between at, you know at, at ground level and and into the earth. So I don't think getting you know uranium certainly represents something you know way more productive and when it's done right way safer. But um, yeah, getting to getting where government is out of the way of the energy industry entirely. It is slowing us down so much by subsidizing the oil and gas industry today and even the automotive industry with uh, subsidizing infrastructure. Like, why should government build the roads instead of having that cost internalized to the people who use them and the industries that profit from them? That would create appropriate settings for the incentives for competition that would get us away from the entire primary transportation paradigm today of an internal combustion engine spinning four rubber wheels down a paved road, burning fossil fuels uh, in the process. So as he points out, 100% renewables would require increasing the land used for energy from today's 0.5% to 50%. Um, I, I'm a little suspicious of that, but uh, I get his point. I think this assumes that there isn't going to be greater uh, technological development. Increasing the land from 5% to 50% might be a solar panel on every roof, and you're not really using more land. To, to switch to renewables on that. So uh, we should want cities, farms, and power plants to have higher, not lower power densities. Yes, he's talking about scales of efficiency. And uh, vegetarianism reduces one's emissions by less than 4%. Yeah, so if you're doing it for that reason, you're doing it for the wrong reason. This is another cool historical thing he points out here. Greenpeace didn't save the whales. Switching from whale oil to petroleum and palm oil did. Free range beef would require 20 times more land and produce 300% more emissions. Greenpeace dogmatism worsened forest defragmentation of the Amazon. The colonialist approach to guerrilla conservation in the Congo produced a backlash that may have resulted in the killing of 250 elements. Surprise, surprise, unintended consequences. Why were we all so misled in the final three chapters of Apocalypse Never? I expose the financial, political, and ideological motivations. Once you realize just how badly misinformed we have been, often by people with plainly unsavory or unhealthy motivations, it is not hard to feel duped. So to sum it up at the end, he says, that is all I hope for in writing it. You've, if you've made it this far, I hope you'll agree that it's perhaps not as strange as it seems that a lifelong environmentalist Progressive and climate activists felt the need to speak out against alarmism. I further hope that you'll accept my apology. Related to the story, we go to the Good News Network. Americans say they're becoming more environmentally conscious each year and their green changes are contagious. So as a libertarian, you know, one of the reasons that I, I mean, the main reason I'm a libertarian is because it's, it's ethics applied to politics. I, I believe in ethics. I believe in doing the right thing and understanding when is it okay to use force against people and when isn't it? One of my, you know, our main motivation in, in, in looking at these problems in the first place that lead me to libertarianism is wanting to make the world a better place. And making it better for people, of course, comes first. Now, making it better for the environment is critical to making it better for people. And a lot of libertarians kind of, uh, you know, under uh, estimate the significance of the relevance of libertarianism to environmentalism when it comes to just maximizing value for humanity. Even if you're the, the capitalist, hardcore, 
kind of libertarian and you want to increase the bottom line, well, we want to maximize the value of the environment. And that's a luxury that comes with being able to provide food, water, clothing, shelter, or, you know, basic human needs first, and then using the environment as, and then we go, okay, we got that covered. You know, because when you're worried about, hey, am I going to be able to feed my kids? You're not worried about, hey, are the, the lead pellets in my shotgun poisoning birds, you know, generations from now? No, that's a luxury that, that you know, you, once you have those needs met, you get to be more environmentally conscious. And, and there is a true, you know, green revolution driven mostly by the left and they're fear mongering still. But as we saw from that letter uh, from Michael, that there is a, a, a shift to more reasoned environmentalism without the alarmism. So here it is from goodnewsnetwork.org. In a bid to be more environmentally conscious, 85% of Americans surveyed have made at least one positive change in their lifestyle in the past year. The great news is that a growing interest in becoming more eco-aware is a movement that's contagious. Half of those polled say they've influenced somebody else to be more environmentally conscious, with the average respondent saying they've swayed three of their friends. While the average American has made at least three positive changes in the last year, 41% of those polled so say They've made even more than that, according to a new survey of 2,000 adults. Four in 10 of those polled reported making an environmentally conscious decision at least once a week. And nearly one in three said they do so daily. And environmental awareness appears to grow with time and age. So this is really exciting. When you see all of these dynamics combining, it really represents a huge positive shift for humanity. An evolutionary leap, if you will to a more conscientious species. Now, in this article, also list the top 10 lifestyle changes Americans have made in the past year. Number one, not wasting food. How about that? Number two, turning off electronics when I'm not using them. That's 42%. Uh, purchasing food that is sustainably raised or produced, 37%. Recycling more, 34%. Cutting down on plastic use, 31%. Buying products with traceability labeling, 27%, reducing water usage in my home, 25%, using eco-friendly products, 25%, composting, 24%, fixing broken items instead of throwing them away, 24%. Now, it's funny that these are things that we didn't do, really, when you look back at it. You know, I think about this, it's like, you know, what, how we, you know, are living more conscientiously at the Garden of Freedom. We, we really do all of these things. You know, not, not, I mean, are we super food conscious, you know, and sparing every little bit about not wasting? I mean, no, because if you're composting, right, you know, you're using that anyway, but we were generally not wasteful here. Uh, we, we are electronic conscious because we have, uh, you know, specific limited capacity that we've established in a sustainable means with solar. Uh, pur purchasing food that is sustainably raised or produced, check. Uh, recycling more. Well, do we recycle more words? You know, we're, we're upcycling all of our waste here uh, into construction materials. Cutting down on plastic use. Again, it's like if you're composting, you don't care about wasting food as much. Um, when you're upcycling your plastic bottles. But uh, generally, like I, what is, you guys see what this is? This is, this is like, if, if I wanted a big jug of, pla you know, a plastic jug to drink water out of and wanted something like, well, Jim, what's yours? You have, you, you have it with you? Oh, Jim has a big fancy black yeah, bottle that's steel, stainless man. steel and insulated, right? And there's a decent amount of material. Like I, the amount of material that went into that, how many of these could you make with this tiny thin wall plastic? Probably 20 of these. 20, 30. What's the weight of your empty bottle versus the weight of an empty gallon jug of plastic, right? Probably 20, 30 times. Yeah. And it's metal. So, you know, if I go and, and I if I had I've had those and I've broken them or lost them or you chip the thing. So I'd rather go with this. So this is my way of and, and if I when, when I'm done with it, if it gets too dirty, I put it in my pile and it gets upcycled eventually. Uh, there are tons of uses for these in construction with fun projects, homesteading. And um, so do I, so I do, I do, I cut down on my plastic use. It's kind of just a general habit. Uh, and then upcycling and, and saving everything. Buying products with traceability labeling. Uh, barely. I'm not really that. I don't buy that much. So I'm not that conscientious of that. But if that's important to you, right? 
Um, if I have the option, I'm, I'm you know, going to buy some. This is made with recycled materials. If it's the same price as something that doesn't say it. So, yeah. I, is that what they mean by traceability labeling? I have no idea. I like my stainless steel because I've heard it filters the water. The stainless steel absorbs shit out of the water? I don't really. It filters the water. Just by being in a container, not just by a being filter. in a stainless steel. Stainless steel draws impurities out of the water in it. When I when I empty the container, there is like a residue on the side. So the residue. So you want out. a surface that the residue because it's got it's a brush textured surface that minerals will bond to. As so I guess, well, there's a minor effect there. All right, um, reducing water use. Well, I guess traceability is more about where where things are sourced in general, like where did your food come from? Um, not just the, the container, but reducing water usage in my home. Yeah, we're very conscious here off grid using eco-friendly products. Yeah, when there's an option. Composting, we do that. Fixing broken items instead of throwing them away. Oh yeah, you kind of have to out here. <laughs>